Um, so yeah, thanks again for joining us. Um, use the chat if you have any questions and I'll put in some questions and timer or teasers in there as we work our way through. And mostly uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, all right, with that, take it away, Kelly. Thanks, thanks, Kevin. Um, welcome everybody, thank you for joining us today. I assume many of you have heard about our incredible seed library that uh, RPL helped us to uh, bring to the community. It's been um, quite a cool thing. And this, this PowerPoint presentation is something that I've been giving over the course of the last year, and I keep updating it and changing it because so much more keeps happening. So it's basically about the catalyst that the seed library has become for our community and um, further communities out from where we are. So welcome today. And uh, so I started the Plant a Seed initiative um, in fall of 2017. And my objective was to educate about our food system uh, through monthly films, Q&A sessions, that kind of thing. Kevin, advance, please. So, so the films and discussions that I've shown over the course of the last couple of years have been in various locations. They're free and I offer them so that we can all learn more about our food system. I personally believe that the food system is the most impactful system that we have on the planet and it touches all of our lives and is, uh, the, the, the things that fall out of the food system are just pretty, pretty wide ranging and incredible. So um, the discussions highlighted the negative effects of farming, air, soil, water conditions, that kind of thing, impact on human health, medical system. And I really, I really didn't know where this was going to go. So um, next slide. So during one of the films, I got to get reacquainted with Heidi Cass, who uh, graduated high school with me um, in, from JM in 82, and our class was about 650 people, so I really didn't hang around with her. But she came to all of my films, and we got to talking, and we decided we wanted to start a seed library. So we started the seed library, and the proposal was accepted in April of 2018. Next slide. What that offered for us was an ability to think about how we were going to do the site seed library, how we were going to be bringing it to the community of Rochester and how we could best help our diverse community. So we started that year that summer before the seed library even existed by attending the market for all at the Rochester farmers market and we handed out t shirts. Uh, we handed out seeds. We had people write on the list the seeds that they would like to see offered from the library got some really cool suggestions. Uh, we gathered feedback and um, we just sort of promoted the library, what we didn't know that it was going to be over those market for alls in the first three weekends of August in 2018. Next slide. As we progressed through um, through the process of planning for the seed library that fall in 2018, we offered some seed saving workshops that weren't from vegetables necessarily, but they were from things that we had collected in the wild or had saved in our own gardens that summer, uh, just so that we could introduce the concept of seed saving to our audience members. And we had a nice little turnout. It was in the auditorium of the library. And then we progressed through the fall and we um, came into winter time of 2019. We offered, um, the Seed Movie, The Untold Story, which we had a nice turnout for. Catherine Gilbury from Seed Savers Exchange came, and that's the upper photo that you see in the right corner there. She came and did a nice presentation on seed saving. The auditorium was packed and we needed to add more seats. And then of course, in January, we started packaging seeds. We packaged 6,629 seeds and over 100 volunteers joined us at our seed packaging events, which are a lot of fun, by the way. This is a plug for uh, this winter coming up when we do it again. So next slide. In March of 2019, we opened the seed library. Seems like so long ago now. The first season um, was, um, was very different than this last season, of course, but the library offered us the space, which is the upper left photograph there, offered us the space right next to meeting room B, which was phenomenal. So I designed the space and uh, figured out what we were gonna put in there. We worked as a team to coordinate all of the, um, the, the icons, the branding, the library was in the process of rebranding their look. So we utilized all of that new, those new ideas from Karen and collected materials, built a garden bench, that kind of thing. And we, we opened on the second. Um, the space in the seed rack, which is the taller rack, has our purchase seeds that we purchased in bulk that you would check out with your library card. 
And then the card catalog, which you see the, the vintage wooden card catalog is where we have our community donated seeds. Lots of handouts to um, information from University of Minnesota Extension, as well as Seed Savers Exchange, lots of information to get you going on gardening, seed saving, cooking, how-to guides, that kind of a thing. Next slide, please. So pretty easy how to use the seed library. Many of you might be familiar with this. There's just five easy steps. Anyone with a Minnesota library card can check out the seeds from the seed rack, but anybody can grab as many seeds as they can use and need from the card catalog, from the community donated seeds. Those do not need to be checked out. And uh, the objective of the seed library is that um, you won't need any of us anymore. This was designed to be a completely self-sustaining project, um, commitment to the community to advance food food justice, food security, food sovereignty, so that we could all do this on our own. And we're getting closer. Next slide. <clears throat> so as I said, we opened on March 2nd. By March 13th, um, we had already checked out 25% of the seeds in the seed library. Uh, that was only 11 days after opening and we were 25% down from our stock. Next slide. On April 19th, we had checked out 52% of the stock and the program was phenomenally um, successful, accepted, and it was just pretty, pretty shocking, uh, the overwhelming response that we had, we had had. Over 3,500 seeds had been checked out by then and we were out of carrots, bell peppers, habanero peppers, tomatillos, basil, lemongrass, parsley, mint, and cilantro. Because of our short growing season, we did not reorder all of those seeds. We simply just reordered the carrots and cilantro because as many of you as growers might know, you can do succession planting with those crops and, and get several crops throughout the growing season. So we just reordered the carrots and the cilantro. Next slide. So one of the things I was doing at the time was I was writing my thesis on food security, specifically how we can lead change in increasing food security through urban agriculture to um, increase fresh food access. I had become very interested in the food system, the pluses of it, the minuses of it, uh, making it more sustainable, reducing supply chains, that kind of a thing. And in January, before the seed library opened, I actually had come across um, the uh, USDA um, Food, uh, the Food um, Systems Atlas from the Economic Research Service that they do. And there were no food deserts in Rochester in 2006, believe it or not. But in 2015, um, the most recent map they have, they've updated it for 2020 now. You can see our city of Rochester there, um, the documented food uh, areas that are considered food deserts. And there's two ways to uh, kind of designate a food desert. You can be over a half a mile away from a grocery store so in other words, foot, foot accessible or non-wheel accessible or 10 miles away from a grocery store. And back in 2006, our population was such that we had um, density and placement of grocery stores that could be accessed by everyone. In 2015, our density increased significantly and the grocery stores had spread out. Many of the smaller little accessible points had been diminished. But now what we see coming into play are the quick trips, the Casey's, the, um, those, those convenience stores that are actually offering fresh food choices or um, staples, milks, meats, eggs, cheeses, fresh vegetables, that kind of thing. But they really aren't a grocery store. So they're actually kind of skewing the system in how we look at accessing fresh food. They diminish the food desert area as far as access goes, but we all know the price points that food can be accessed at at those types of locations is significantly higher than um, your regular standard grocery store. So I use this data in my thesis and it's been really awesome to drive some of the other changes that you're gonna hear about that we've done in the city. Next slide. First and foremost, what happened um, after the seed library opened is Olmsted County Public Health had uh, contacted me about putting some gardens into the HRA uh, spaces. So we put three, three gardens in, and this garden is a picture at Westwood. These two pictures are at Westwood, which is about two and a half miles away from the closest grocery store. 
And we had lots of partners with this. Like I said, Olmsted County Public Health, the HRA, University of Minnesota Extension Master Gardeners, and even the Centers to Serve folks from um, the Federal Medical Center came and donated their time and labor to do the smother and cover technique for how these three gardens were established. So out of these three gardens, we have about a quarter of an acre of growing space and the residents were really, really helpful. The woman next to the wheelbarrow there um, is a Cambodian uh, refugee who's been living here for quite some time. And all she wanted to do was shovel compost. It was pretty incredible. We would line up the wheelbarrows for her and she would start shoveling, filling them from first to last. And we would just come by, pick up one, roll it 200 feet away to the garden space, roll back the empty one. And she was just a shoveling machine. Pretty, pretty incredible. Um, the interest that was, that was, that went into establishing these gardens. So this particular garden is about 60 by 35 at Westwood. And we have six different cultures that are represented at the HRA gardens. Next slide. By May 31st, we had 78% of the seed stock checked out and we had already placed several reorders of, um, of stock to keep the seed stock up to get us through the end of the season. Next slide. One of our other partners was um, the ALC, the Alternative Learning Center in Rochester. So most of the youth that are there, they struggle um, in the summer because they don't have a lot of people there. So we started managing this location to make the garden more productive and work on it. And these alternative learners uh, are producing honey from the beehives that were there. And uh, also the veg would get distributed to families on the bookmobile. The land that they garden on is next to Channel One and it's owned by the um, Southeast Service Cooperative. So they donate all of the land to the ALC to grow food. Next slide. All of the seeds for the ALC garden came from the seed library and some transplants came from Seed Savers Exchange. So like I said, the bookmobile was delivering food last summer, doing a great job at um, getting food out to low literacy areas. And then now let's go back to that food, not literally, figuratively, in our minds, let's go back to that food access map that showed the food deserts. One of the things that the, um, that the data that we gathered from the seed library was rerouting of the bookmobile. They discovered that they weren't quite going into some of the areas that might have been better served. So they altered their routes based on the data that we had gathered from uh, the seed library, which is pretty cool. So they were able to even do more good with that. Uh, around this time, uh, I actually started some conversations with Kevin with DMC because I wondered how sustainable the bookmobile was. They were already at capacity and we wondered what more we could do. So we started gathering people um, to discuss the United Way, Olmsted County Public Health, Channel One, um, the Regional Food Bank, SNAP Ed, and we wondered about um, a mobile grocery, how we could possibly implement a mobile grocery in Rochester that might better serve our low income, low access folks in the community. Uh, next slide, please. Revolutionary Earth was also um, uh, really touched by the seed library. All of the seeds came from them their first season and it helped them to be able to um, really meet their mission, which is serving the poorest first, the best to the poorest first and really cut down on um, what Chris talks about as quick quiz. How many of you know what the largest crop in America is? Let's do a show of hands on that if we can. Everybody click on raising your hand to see if you know what the largest crop in America is. Stephanie does. Stephanie, can you unmute and tell us what you think it is? Oh, somebody else does. Hello. Hi, Sorry. It was going a little slow. Um, I would say turf grass is the largest crop. Ding, ding, ding. We have a winner. Yes, turf grass is the largest crop in America, folks. Can you believe that? More than the feedlots, more than the corn, more than the soybeans, turf grass is the largest crop we grow in America. Devoid of nutrition for our pollinators, devoid of nutrition for ourselves. The dogs might get a few bites when they need, need to ease their stomach aches, but um, yeah, turf grass is not, is not the winner in the, uh, in the food system. So that's Chris's mission, to eliminate turf grass and grow more food, and he's on it. That first year of 2019, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, that first year 
he was able to provide 30 plus CSA members, which was pretty pretty phenomenal. Um, nearly all of their seeds came from the seed library and they also had transplants from others as well. Next slide. The village, which is growing even more. Um, that first year they were donated um, 11 acres by a benefactor. Unfortunately, we had some significant flooding. Uh, the tilling that was done on that lot and just the uh, soil soil management over the years of conventional farming didn't turn out to be the best for the village, but they, they produced as much as they could. Um, they committed food to the food pantry at UMR. As many of you may know, UMR does not have a cafeteria for their students. So um, we've got some food food access issues there for the students that are there. But uh, we provide food to the food pantry from uh, the village. All of their seeds came from the seed library that year and many transplants from Seed Savers Exchange. Um, so they've been a big help at contributing to food system security in Rochester as well. Next slide. Oak Terrace um, and Parkside is a smaller community down Marion Road, mostly uh, Latinx. And they have had some major sponsorship through the Seventh-day Adventist Church, as well as University of Minnesota Extension SNAP Ed. Milena Nunez Garcia is a great proponent of helping them out. And a couple of years ago, they got their garden going. It's large, it's 60 by 80. And we, um, what we did was something special for them. We showed up at Oak Terrace at an event, Carrie Aspie and I did, and we had a pre-programmed library card to be able to check out seeds. So the patrons, patrons of the library didn't actually need to go to the library. We offered the seeds through a special program event that they had that spring. So the people that were there um, didn't need to actually do extra work. Many of these people are low income. They're working a few jobs. We've got single parent households. So we wanted to make the accessibility to the seed library as high as we possibly could to increase the equity there. And um, they did checkouts and got a lot of seeds for their garden, which is a pretty, pretty neat thing to do. This year, we were supposed to have the tour of the masters uh, one of the event sites there, but because of COVID, we did not. If any of you log on to the Olmsted County Master Gardeners uh, Facebook page, you can watch the, vi the virtual tour there. And there's a special section devoted to local food, which is one of our priorities um, that we have of the seven priorities for the Master Gardeners. So the Oak Terrace Garden was featured this year. They have a pretty incredible food garden if you want to drive down Marion Road and take a look at it. it it's sort of across from Longfellow uh, Elementary School and the Armory, just across on the uh, east side of Marion Road. Next slide. Whoops. Back one, please, Kevin. Oh dear, no. My bad, I advanced my slides differently. So you're on the right one, thank you. Kevin and I are running two different slides here. Uh, just because we like to live life on the edge, basically. Um, so August 17th, we closed the library last year. Our thoughts were, you know, it's a little too late to be starting your last crop unless you're, you know, you're using some serious row covers and you've got some hoop house advantages. Most gardeners don't have that, but wow, we moved 8,500 packages of seeds our first year and we put in over 800 hours of volunteer contribution. And that comes from everybody in the community. So thank you so much for that. That was that was the success of our first year. So um, next slide. The final delivery from the CSA program at Revolutionary Earth was on October 4th. And this is an example of what their CSA boxes look like. They um, use the incredible model of Meals for Wheels, excuse me, Meals on Wheels, if you know about that completely volunteer run. Volunteers show up, they're trained, they deliver the food, they ask questions, they can even do some minor health checks. So that's the model that's kind of being used for this. It's all volunteers. No money changed hands their first year. It's all just out of community, community gifts, grassroots participation and starting. So uh, 11 weeks of their CSA, they served 75, or no, excuse me, they served 38 families and their their hopes were to expand to 75 families this year. Um, and as I said, uh, 100 people were uh, receiving goods from the village gardens in the UMR food pantry. And the partnerships that were formed a first year um, really impacted many local communities um, that assumed leadership roles 
in becoming keys uh, to our future in in fostering food system resilience and uh, more civic engagement. So it's pretty pretty awesome thing our first year. So next slide. Of course, we have to do it again. We got rave reviews and we're in this for the long haul. As I said, we want this program to be completely self-sustaining so you don't have to listen to my voice on these PowerPoints anymore. But um, we want the community to really understand uh, the importance of uh, reducing food miles, understanding good sound watering practices when we grow food so we can grow it sustainably and understanding how um, important our pollinators are. So we started again uh, in January. Only this year we decided to package 12,000 package of seeds. We thought we thought that was a reasonable goal and uh, we bellied up to that uh, 12,000 seed packaging bar and it was it was pretty awesome. Um, 125 Live offered their space. They wanted to become a part of it. And one thing interesting during this packaging process, we, we had tweaked some of the things such as um, different different packaging. How are we going to do the envelopes differently? We had an insert last year. Did we want to do an insert again? Um, the sponsors that had offered grants to us, we didn't have to have their logos on the back of the package anymore. So could we utilize the back of the packaging for other things? And what we found out as we got rolling through our first day of uh, volunteer packaging is we couldn't we couldn't believe how fast it was going. And uh, so I did a quick calculation and what we found out, I don't remember the number specifically, but we had eliminated the insert, the how to grow insert that was found in um, the first year's packaging. And instead we put that insert on a label for the back of the packaging. Well, the quick math, 15 seconds to put an insert into 12,000 envelopes was about 16 hours worth of work. So depending upon whether there were 16 people doing it, devoting an hour, or if it just trickled out through the course of two weekends of seed packaging, it was pretty, pretty immense. 16 hours is a lot of work. We ended up shaving off a whole weekend of work just by eliminating the inserts. So that was a really neat thing to find out. It saved paper waste, it saved labor. And of course, we didn't need as many volunteers, which is kind of a drag because it's always nice to get to know new people in the community. But it was really a neat thing to learn. So uh, whenever you're working on a process, kind of a manufacturing sort of production process, which is what this is, each one of those pieces is, is so important in what you do. Next slide. So back to that bookmobile, back to that conversation um, that I started you down with many partners on creating a mobile grocery store. Where we ended up was that we really didn't know if a mobile grocery store was a right fit for our community. Uh, what we really decided we needed was a food security assessment. Olmsted County had done a phenomenal job with their uh, healthy needs assessment. The downfall with that was that they only asked two food security questions, but in their defense, it wasn't a food security assessment. So we put a proposal together. I worked with uh, Susan Draves of Snap Ed and Anna Oldenburg of Olmsted County Public Health. We put together this proposal and submitted it to um, University of Minnesota Extension Southeast Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships, which are phenomenal. And they accepted our proposal and we got a grant for $8,000 to do a food security assessment, which is currently underway for Olmsted County in Rochester. And I'm excited to get the recommendations from this. I'm excited to see where we're going. We're currently in phase two. We have Matthew Gabb, a graduate student um, with University of Minnesota, um, the Humphrey School of Public Affairs. He is a regional and urban planner. He's in his first year of graduate work. And we've also got Dr. Fi Dr. Fiola Jacobs working as his advisor. So we're working with him to get this, uh, a lot of this data in GIS, gathering the information that we have so far on Rochester. And we're hoping that it's gonna help our community to better serve our residents um, it, through the food system, uh, understanding where we need to drive change and do a better job at doing what we do to serve those that need more services and just helping out those who really wanna be able to do more, uh, greater good, and then also placing smaller grocery stores where they need to be or actually implementing that uh, mobile food grocery. So looking forward to that food assessment coming out. So fast forward, next slide. 
The Seed Library opened this year on uh, February 29th, and the open house was even, even more outstanding than it was our first year. Uh, the upper right picture shows people waiting in line to check out seeds for over 20 minutes because the line wrapped around nearly to the top of the stairs by the elevators. And uh, it was a little frightening when I went upstairs to check. I was on I was on with actually Stephanie hudson our um, education specialist with Public Works. I am a master water steward for the city of Rochester with Stephanie. And uh, I was doing a table with her that day. And I said, I'll be right back. And I never came back. I went up and saw the mob, this wonderful mob of people waiting to check out seeds. And the library helped me scramble to get out our old rack and set up another checkout station and pull uh, drawers out of the card catalog to kind of spread out the, uh, the Black Friday showing we had so that we wouldn't have this mob and people could get through more quickly and they could ask more questions of the master gardeners that were on, on board to answer any gardening questions. And uh, yeah, so phenomenal showing again. Cuckoo Kachu provided these incredible treats based off of some of the seeds that we have. Uh, for instance, those yummy, yummy rolls in the lower right corner, uh, they were turned pink by beet juice and we offer beets in the seed library. Stephanie brought some great, um, great educational, interpretive education signage and some fun hands-on activities that the kids could do. You can see that lovely little girl there in a, uh, what is that a blossom of? That is a blossom of something I can't identify. It looks like Monarda potentially, Monarda fistulosa perhaps. So over 250 attendees and next slide please. Lots of, lots of seeds checked out that day. Um, uh, it was a great, great event. And what we offered, next slide, what we offered this year, one of the changes, we added a larger rack that was more easily accessible and that the library actually wouldn't have to spend so much time in restocking. We could have four or five positions for those things that everybody wants, such as beans and peas and a couple of offerings for carrots instead of just one section back. So it took, it took a little bit of the burden off of the RPL staff they wouldn't have to restock as often. And then we also offered all of our how-to guides. We didn't need to redo as many because we only changed up a couple of varieties for this year. But the big change to the seed library, next slide, was the languages. Um, the first year we offered in Spanish, English, Somali, and Arabic. But this year we were really happy and proud to offer um, Khmer, Khmer as we know it, it's Khmer in Cambodian. And then we also added Chinese. I'm not quite sure if the Chinese we offered is Mandarin specifically or if it's just called Chinese. But there you can see our uh, beautiful seed list. The Arabic is on the right with the flush right margin. And then you've got Mandarin next over, excuse me, Chinese next over. And then um, the Khmer, which is that beautiful scrolly language in the middle, and then of course Spanish, and then we've got Somali up in the upper upper left corner. So pretty proud to be able to do that. Um, neighborhood um, residents, community members offered to translate. We also had help from IMAA, as well as uh, somebody actually in Cambodia, Kim Sin with The Village helped to connect us to um, a young gal in Cambodia that did our uh, Khmer, Khmer translation. Next slide, please. And this is what our seed library ended up looking like. Uh, the table this year, you can see all six of our languages and that's in that new branded library look that they have, which is pretty fun. Next slide. In 2019, the Girl Scouts wanted to start a program and they worked really hard on it called the Silver Seeds and they wanted to utilize those two planters that are outside of, um, outside of the library. And we were all set to do that this year, 2020. Um, really some great ideas. The planters were gonna be planted with um, some edibles that people could just munch on as they passed by. They were gonna maintain them, got the full go ahead from Parks and Rec. They were gonna do QR codes and also piggyback with some other planters in the downtown area. We sort of have this secret vision to convert all of the downtown planters into edible food. I think that would be really cool. And had a dialogue with, um, the RDA with Holly Masek earlier in the year about that. But as you know, COVID just sort of stopped everything. And that's what happened with the Girl Scouts project, their Silver Seeds project. What they were able to do is, um, is grow some food at home and not, not the most successes, too shady, 
uh, not enough water in certain areas. Some of the transplants that they grew from seed just weren't weren't really viable, didn't survive. But they're going to plug along, and also the construction on Second Street was was a real detriment to what we wanted to do. So look for those planter boxes next year, which I think will be very fun. And going to partner with Riverside as well, and hopefully we can get in with the RDA and do even some more food boxes, which would be which would be pretty cool. And the QR codes that lead you through sort of food system information, um, data, that kind of thing. Next slide. So a week after we opened this year, again, really hot stats. 20% of the seed was gone and 2,000 um, packages had been checked out. Next slide. So even after the seed library had opened, um, people were donating seeds. And this is this is a part we're not quite sure how we're going to get right. The education on when to donate seeds. We're doing the classes. We're, we're teaching you how to save seeds. There's lots of information out on the internet for how to save seeds. But um, we really want to get the donations in the fall, if at all possible, so we can start cataloging. There's, there's a lot of cataloging that goes on. And hats off to technical services at RPL the most dedicated, most equitable organization in our city. And technical services is just really phenomenal. Just to let you know, the 12,000 packages that we packaged this year that you could check out, each one of those is like an individual book. Each one of those is like finding 450 books on peas in the card catalog so that if you check one out, your neighbor can go check one out, all of us participating in this presentation can check one out, and so can everyone in your neighborhood. That means that technical services has to spend time entering that record into their catalog. An RFID tag is placed on that envelope so that it will beep going out the door so that you have to check it out so that we can track where that package goes, how many packages have left, when we need to reorder, we are one of the only libraries in the nation that has done this so far, near as I can tell. We are a national leader in how our seed library works, the impact that it has, and the volume of seeds that are checked out. So again, kudos to um, TSC for getting this job done. They basically have all hands on deck for over a week. These people just sit there entering these these data points on peas, on beans, on on Detroit Lakes um, beets to get them entered into the record, making it possible for you to check out seeds or to go online to reserve the seeds. So if we can get those seed donations front loaded more in the fall, um, that's really helpful to us. But nonetheless, any donation that comes into the library, their policy is to not get rid of it. So we packaged all of the seeds. We continued to package through February, through March. And um, I think we got done at the end of March or maybe even into April. I think I took some home to be packaged. But this is a wonderful donation of perilla. You might know it as shiso. It's a yummy red leaf in the hibiscus family. And um, it came in in this package, which was great. We knew that it came from Baker Creek, so we could go online and actually look this seed up to get the scientific name, the specific epithet, and learn its grow growing habits, that kind of thing, to be able to put on our labeling. What we would like is people to use the seed return or the donation form with all of the information. And we're not trying to make this difficult, but um, we do want our patrons to know what they're getting in a seed package. So looking at that upper left photograph there, you can see some of the seeds in those little Ziploc baggies there. Another donation came in completely unlabeled. So it was really fun for me as a master gardener to go, ooh, this is the cucurbit family. This is either cantaloupe or a cucumber. I don't know what it is, but we can't get rid of it because it's a donation. So we ended up repackaging them and we had a little, um, we had a little fun section of uh, seeds called mystery seeds. And many people stepped up to the plate to take these seeds home, plant them, chime back on Facebook saying, this is what I got in my package. It was pretty cool. And we relabeled them and it was a fun thing, but that's that's not that's not what we want to try and achieve. But it's been fun to just work with the library and see all of the creative ideas that they have and the work that they're willing to do. So 
back to this package of Perilla here. I had to clean it when it came in and I felt so bad that I was making the library a mess, but I dumped it all into a big clean bin. And this is just, this is primitive tech here, folks. This is what you have seen growing up. Many people throwing, winnowing the seeds up into the air and the wind catches it, blowing the chafe away. And eventually after doing this, you're left with just seeds, clean seeds in a bin. So that's what's in this little ceramic bowl here in the lower left. The perilla, very, very small seeds, about the size of a poppy seed. And um, they, uh, they started out in the package. We cleaned them. They ended up here. And just a few people were able to get some of those perilla seeds because we had just enough to give out. But it's nice to be able to offer those things to the community, people that want to grow, um, you know, something special. Phew. Next slide, please, Kevin. This is what those perilla seeds looked like when we got done. We design a front label, we enter the data into a template, and then the data that we look up um, may be sown in place in long summer climates, indoors, set outside after last frost, quarter inch sowing depth, days to germination, four to seven. So we need to look this up for all of the community donated seeds that we get. So filling out that form is, um, is pretty helpful to us so that we don't have to look all of this stuff up. But I have to tell you, I had never grown shiso before, so I, I dove right into this one. It was pretty exciting. Next slide. So a week after opening this year, no surprises. Almost 2,500 seeds were checked, seed packages checked out, and 26% of our stock was gone. Um, on the weekends, it, they're most busy. So next slide, or I'm sorry, not next slide, but so you can see going back to March 6th, we had checked out 20%, but on March 8th, 6% uh, of the stock had left, another 500 seed packages. So the new rack that we have this year really, really helped um, RPL staff to not have to continue to feed it and the volunteers come in to monitor um, the seed the seed rack to make sure that it's full for everybody. So next slide. A quick question for you, Kelly, from the chat. Yeah. Um, said seed donations start being accepted in the fall. Is there an approximate date that you would prefer for when seed donations should occur in the fall? No, um, I see Matt is asking that question. And actually right now, Matt, we're gonna progress through the um, presentation and there's a link. Actually, I'm just gonna tell you right now, it's rplmn.org forward slash seed. And you can download that, uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Um, you can download the seed donation form and we're not actually sure how the donations are going to come in yet because of COVID. I don't know if we're going to have to. Um, RPL has some really wonderful strict rules with COVID to keep everybody safe. And they've got that awesome curbside service that they've done. So I don't know if we're going to have to put them in like an outside airtight box for three days to quarantine or, or what they're going to do. But, but we are working on that, Matt. So that's a good question. Um, but there's some information on that link if you want to look at that. So... We closed down due to the pandemic and um, I, of course, freaked out and thought, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? We got to get the seeds out to the people. So next slide. Um, I had a wild hair to deliver stuff and Carrie obliged. Um, she's so kind. Uh, and we actually delivered a big package of seeds to the Homestead Trails Community Garden. April Suter is the neighborhood president out there and she jumped through hoops and gathered a bunch of information and put together a big order that we um, delivered to took a bunch to Oak Terrace, out to the village. I think uh, Revolutionary Earth got a bunch. Anybody that wanted the seeds got them. Um, but of course, they were reviewing the policies for COVID then, and they decided we couldn't do that anymore, so they went to mailing. So um, that was ultimately the decision that we had made. Next slide. Um, so the village, the village took a bunch of slides, and this is a kind of a melange of um, beginning of the season there. They ended up changing locations due to the flooding and just poor access. We were given um, two gardens that Channel One could no longer manage. So COVID-19 has brought a really um, cool scenario to the food system here. We've had gaps in our food service because of um, supply chain linkage breakage. We've had um, a lot of people wanting to grow seeds. We've had every single seed house in North America closed down temporarily to meet demand. 
we have had um, more interest in growing food since the 1970s, and time will tell this fall, hopefully somebody is gathering data on this, but back in the 40s, Victory Garden time, 40% of our food came from private sources. You and me growing food, um, the public lawns, public gardens, that kind of a thing. So I'm curious to see what we've done this year. I don't think we're going to have that kind of uh, that kind of community um, buy-in, but I know we're close to what we were doing in the 70s with kind of that back to the land movement. So these photos are in the village show early spring individual plots. And FYI, the village is free. You don't need to pay to get a garden plot there. It's pretty awesome. And they offer water. Um, this is a kind and helpful hint to the city of Rochester. I understand we've got a lot of significant economic challenges ahead and the budget needs to be cut, but um, we need to grow more food. We need to shorten our supply chain, increase our local supply chain, and we do need water to grow food. So if we can get water at our community garden sites, that would be really awesome. I have no idea what that looks like, but people flocked to the village this year. They're gonna be expanding. These sites are at the Covenant Church, the Presbyterian Church, and uh, it's pretty awesome that they have given us, turned over, turned over these spaces to community gardeners and immigrant cultures that wanna grow more food. You can see some really neat um, gourds there. I think that's called snake bean, but it's actually a gourd. And then on the right, um, okay, time for a quick new poll. Raise your hand if you have ever grown Cleome. Uh, it's a common name is spider flower. Nobody? Do we have any hands up, Kevin? No, okay, so my grandpa used to grow Cleome. It's a cool, neat flower. Had no idea it was an edible, no clue whatsoever. Cleome's edible, folks. They eat the leaves. It's pretty neat. They're saving the seeds out there for the crop next year. And Kenya grows a different variety than Cambodia. And Cambodia grows a different variety than other cultures. So it's been really neat how these cultures have come together in our city to grow food. And it's really minimizing PTSD. It's helping to add food security to communities that haven't had it. Farmers that left their farms, that left their homes under just really horrible conditions and they haven't had land access. They now have land access and it's really creating a pretty cool thing. So the village received a lot of our seeds this year in one of those hand packs. But back to what I was saying, um, the library decided that giving out seeds via mail was much better. And uh, advance the slide, please, Kevin. So what we ended up happening it was on April 9th, the library announced that they would take mail-in orders from seeds. They got 400 requests in three days and they had to shut down. Like I mentioned, all of the seed houses shut down um, this year just because they had to keep up with mail-in orders. A lot of people anticipated food insecurity happening and uh, they were right. So um, yeah, the library got caught up in a couple of weeks, um, filled the orders. And um, at the end of April, we were over through over half of our stock. Next slide. Just about six weeks later, um, 11,000 packages were out. We were just about out of everything and all because people wanted to grow food. The community jumped, jumped to grow food and uh, either for others, for ourselves, uh, to donate, uh, grow a row for somebody else. It was, it was happening and it's been a pretty neat season to see. Unfortunately, it was a real dry season, so we needed to rely on um, well water and um, our, our city water system, which adds chlorine to the soil, which is not a good thing, but um, we're, we're getting through it. Um, the last part of our season here has supplied us quite a bit of nice rainwater. Next slide. So I don't know if you guys drive a minivan or a Prius, but I picked my Prius because I wanted to haul lots of stuff. And just FYI, you can get 19 flats of veg in a Prius. It's pretty awesome. I was running around uh, like a chicken with my head cut off, delivering a lot of transplants to lots of people this year. Took a lot of veg up to Frogtown. Uh, Frogtown is in that area of Minneapolis where a lot of riots were, a lot of damage was done. And of course it takes a while to grow food, but their objective this year was to really do a give back to the community to grow as much food as possible because um, there were food system disruptions up there. A lot, of more, a lot more partners came on board this year. Um, the Resilience Garden Project from Seed Savers Exchange. They started their Trunks and Transplants Initiative, and that's what this picture is a part of. Uh, pretty, pretty neat. They 
sent so many seeds out east. They sent seeds out west. A lot of initiatives for seed banking came up this year, and people were just sending seeds everywhere. So was really thankful that we packaged 12,000 seeds this year uh, to meet the need. Uh, we're going to be meeting soon. Uh, to have a seed library committee meeting to determine what next year is going to look like. Don't know if we'll package 12,000 again. Don't know if it'll be 15,000. Don't know if we'll drop back. But um, phenomenal outpouring this year from Revolutionary Earth, the Village, the ALC, the Garden of Eden at Oak Terrace, um, Parkside. We created a couple of new gardens and uh, going to Frogtown up in the cities, of course. So they all got seeds and transplants. Next slide, please. So I said that the ALC garden, we had helped. Their garden, because of the lack of help in the summertime and the students not having much school, we decided to revamp it this year. So I had a lot of people come on board to help create this, um, recreate this garden, revamp it to make it actually a lot more useful. Um, I have special privileges with Warner Stellion Appliance Store. I love them, they're great. Anytime I call, they will give me refrigerator boxes and they bring them down from the cities and we lay out refrigerator boxes and special thanks to the Mayo Clinic and Farmer's Topsoil and Jensen Yard and Landscaping for 40 yards of delivered compost and topsoil to do this garden. And we laid out the irrigation lines and planted it. We even had Nels Pearson, who's one of our house representatives, show up, Project Legacy, some great, um, some great folks from um, the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints showed up and it's just the outpouring of growing food this year is just pretty neat. So it's amazing what comes out of a seed library, a humble little seed library in Rochester. Next slide. So back last fall, we had um, submitted a proposal to Parks and Rec for the MLK Community Food Garden. And we really didn't think it was going to fly this year because of COVID. But once again, you get this outpouring of community efforts. There's just, just this grassroots effort of people that want to do something. And it really doesn't take any, take any money. People have this incredible power with their hands and their minds to just make such good change. And I absolutely love that. So this is the last garden that um, the Seed Library really helped to create this year and it's the MLK Park Community Food Garden. Uh, this is a public garden. There's a lot of plots there and um, people go and harvest if they need it. We've started some educational programming. This is kind of the way I see community gardens going with youth outreach. Uh, the last three weeks that Boys and Girls Club was in session, um, some of their classes walked down to help do some maintenance on the garden, garden, and they actually harvested veg to utilize with their afternoon snacks. We did some horticultural education, pollinator knowledge, and just growing growing vegetables and nutrition. So it was a great a great neighborhood project, and we're not finished with it yet. We need to complete the fence, and this was sort of an inaugural year for it. We really didn't know how it was going to go because of COVID, so we really didn't expect to have a garden this year, but everybody <laughs> pulled through and um, made, made it happen, and it's a pretty a pretty great garden. So if you want to help out, we're going to be building the fence here in the next couple of weeks. Need some strong guys to run the power auger, and we're going to set up some agricultural panels. The fencing in and of itself will increase the growing space by about 315 square feet, which is pretty cool. You don't think that advancing, um, you don't think that advancing a garden with vertical growing space will uh, will really produce a lot more food, but it can. You just grow your grow your food in a certain area. Next slide. Seed Library just closed. Sad day, August 31st. We did over 12,000 packages of seeds and uh, our patrons were really, really thankful, have gotten some really cool feedback on what's been grown. It's on Facebook, people post it on their personal page or on the, um, the Rochester Public Library webpage. I actually reached out to Joe Powers and Susan Wafthal. I met Susan Wafthal, golly, about 25 years ago when she was doing SEMREX, the Southeastern Minnesota Recyclers Exchange. It was sort of a real-time cataloging of reusable, recyclable materials that were left over from construction sites or that could be used um, sort of like a Habitat for Humanity restore, but it was online. And, um, you know, Joe Powers is a mover and shaker here in town with, um, with his knowledge of the food system and the things that he does. So what I'd really like to get started is uh, a food, an online food distribution hub. Um, 
most of us aren't really knowledgeable in how much food a garden can produce. And unless you've, unless you're really on the ball with canning, freezing, um, preserving, dehydrating, you've got a network of people to give it to, we will continue to have food waste. So what I'd really like to see get on board is some kind of a catalog of some kind in real time, internet accessible, that shows where the food is, where the food can go. Um, of course, we're going to need to monitor for safety through, you know, FISMA or GAPS training to make sure that we're using um, good agricultural practices. But I'm I'm hoping somebody's going to pick up on this idea, and we're gonna we're gonna get this uh, on board and get it available for the next growing season. It would it would help out all of those community agencies that are growing a lot of food to deliver. I know it would help to provide food to some of the local um, restaurants and chefs that want to purchase local food, utilize local foods, and it would help, um, you know, the new program that Meals on Wheels has of taking fresh veg to people. So again, let's put our heads together and see what we can do to get a program like this to uh, to get put in place. Hopefully, hopefully we'll see recommendations from this coming um, from the food security assessment that we're doing. Could be could be something that happens. So next slide. Exciting, we reopen on February 27th. Very excited already. Like I said, we're gonna be meeting to see what that's gonna look like. Um, we've got videos and workshops that you can check out on the uh, Seed Library website, which is right there. And Kevin posted it earlier as well. And uh, so lots of things to learn. I think we've got even a, um, a seed saving video on that um, uh, on that web page, so you can check that out and learn about tomatoes because it's great tomato seed saving season and cucumber seed saving season. Don't pull the overgrown ones off the vine. Let them go forever until they turn into these giant yellow balloons because market ready is not the same thing as seed ready. A market ready uh, cucumber is yummy and green and small without big seeds, but a seed ready cucumber is that big Bertha huge thing that's yellow and swollen and you just go, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do with that? You're gonna save seeds. So this is, uh, this is the end of this presentation. So last slide, thank you for attending. And I would also um, like to take any questions. We've got about five minutes left. It looks like somebody has chimed in about contact information. You can, you can see it there on that slide. Please call me anytime, text if you'd like. Uh, there's my email and uh, the seed library people at the library um, are also available. Um, you can answer questions through the web page, through the Facebook page. Um, and then there's, of course, that awesome chat line at RPL. So that's it. I thank you for attending. And do we have any questions from anybody? <clears throat> yeah, maybe we'll keep a, an eye on the chat for another minute. Um, one question I have, Kelly, is we have a lot of engaged folks here on the webinar today. Are there some easy ways that folks can engage in this effort um, in 2021 and beyond? Yes, yes, we do usually announce the uh, the planting, or excuse me, the seed packaging, and we've had toddlers show up. We've had intellectually disabled folks show up. We've had we've had really elderly people who just wanted to do this, and they're visiting from the clinic, and they've just been diagnosed with a terminal disease, and they just wanted to be a part of something really great. So keep your eye on the seed library. We send out information on this. I'll post it on my Facebook, Heidi Cass, my partner in crime here that brought this to, forward to the library. She posts information about it. Olmsted County Extension Master Gardeners, if you follow their Facebook page, we post about it. Um, just, just, a really, just a really great program. Um, NPR did a special on us, maybe they'll do one again. Um, we're community driven. Let's keep, let's keep the community driving and engaged. So uh, in January, we'll probably offer a film again. Maybe, maybe we'll see if we can gather in the auditorium or offer something online. Oh, hey, here's a new link. Post this quick, Kevin. Uh, it's called The Seed Vault on Vimeo. I just watched it a couple days ago. I posted it on my personal Facebook page. Um, Vimeo, The Seed Vault. Really incredible documentary. Definitely worth 20 minutes of your time. Incredible what, um, what we need to do to save our, um, to save our seeds. Uh, so any other questions? Do, do, do. 
Did I answer the last one? Yes, I did. Uh, Monday when I visited the village. Okay, great, good. Um, I'm looking at these questions quickly here. Lots of energy, Ray. Yeah, you don't want to see me on caffeine. <laughs> uh, people ask me if I want to go for coffee, and I just say, not really. No, no, I don't. But I'll meet with you and chat. Uh, be willing to make or contact available. Yes, we did that. Okay, there's the Seed Vault film. Really great film. Beautiful. Worth 20 minutes of your time. And I think that's it. We've got 1258. So a couple more questions if we've got them to come in. Um, but regardless, I thank you. I thank you for your participation um, in our library, in the Seed Library, in growing food for others, in understanding um, how incredibly damaging our food system can be and how incredibly important it is to diversify our foodways and honor our BIPOC um, communities that have been providing old foodways for such a long time. And we as a Western nation are just learning and um, we've done so much damage to our soils and our waters and uh, we need to put food back in the hands of the people. So thank you, thank you so much. Cool. Kelly, this was awesome. Thanks for joining us today in this month. I learned a ton um, and I imagine others did too, so very much appreciated. Yeah. Uh, so yeah.